Well, everybody, as I was saying in the uh, opening uh, remarks, we've uh, got a great show lined up for you. And I have to say, we had Rick Rule lined up to be on the show today. And I've known Rick for, it's going on 30 years. And we were certainly going to be talking about the precious metal space. Rick has been so bullish on silver and gold, platinum as well. But there was another market that Rick's also been very involved in, and that's the uranium space. I really wanted to talk to him about uranium. We couldn't get Rick here today because of the electrical outlet, I should say, failures uh, in Washington State, where he is right now. So I reached out to Drew Zimmerman. Now, Drew is the chief executive officer of uh, Noble Plains Uranium. Uh, a lot of you listening here may remember that Drew, who is my son, by the way, has been on the show a number of times with me as a co-host when we're interviewing people. Uh, but this time he's going to come on and talk to us about the uranium space kind of filling in at very short notice here for Rick Rule, who couldn't be with us today. Rick, uh, I should say, Drew, <laughs> welcome to Money Talks. Good to see you. Yeah, great to be here and apologize that I have to be trying to fill the shoes of, of Rick Rule. That is not going to happen. I mean, those are very big shoes, but uh, I, I can speak ad nauseum about the uranium market and uh, very much involved there. So looking forward to our discussion. Okay, well, now let's get right to it. You are in the business of looking for uranium, and there's got to be a good reason why you're doing that. You've been doing this for the past four years or so. I mean, when I look at electricity prices in the United States, they're going up. I've put charts to that effect in my notes in the past couple of weeks. But what we're all looking forward to here, or if, if we're looking ahead, we can imagine that this tremendous AI development is just going to ramp up the demand for electricity. Where is it all going to come from? And one of the sources is going to be the uranium space. So why don't you just take it away from there? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. It's, you know, everybody notices electricity prices. We get our bill at the end of every month. And when they start to rise, like they have been, I mean, they're up over 26% in the U.S. over the last three years. And again, with the electrification of everything and the big data center build out that is really moving that exponentially higher, um, you know, it's all about where is our, our power going to come from? And especially where is clean power? So the United States already getting 20% of their electricity from nuclear. Uh, in Canada, I think, you know, a little known fact, the uh, province of Ontario gets 50% of their power from nuclear. Uh, you know, Quebec and BC are a little bit more hydro-focused, but it still equals out to about 14 to 15% of Canadian power is nuclear. So when we're looking at nuclear, what is, you know, the commodity behind it? And, and that's where uranium comes into play. You know, there is a nuclear fuel cycle to develop that uranium into the nuclear fuel rods that go into a reactor. But it all starts with uranium. And like any commodity, when you go through decades of low prices, supply goes away. And that's what we've seen uh, throughout the world and, and throughout the United States, especially in 1980, they were the world's largest producer, 44 million pounds a year. They are now just coming off of producing nothing in 2020 and produce under a million pounds while the country continues to consume 50 million pounds a year. So this is a strategic critical mineral that is a vulnerability for the United States. And again, we saw it first with supply chains and COVID and then importantly across multiple commodities uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, that these critical minerals that are needed in our economy you know, aren't always good to be coming from foreign sources. So, you know, that's one of the big pieces of the uranium puzzle right now is how do we get enough good domestic supply or even, you know, friendly supply of uranium back to this market? Well, going along with that thought, I mean, <clears throat> out of the corner of my eye, I have seen what looks like uh, uh, encouragement, <laughs> put a word on it, from the U.S. government to, to go out and find not only uranium, but other critical minerals, and not just to find them, but to develop them, refine them, and all that sort of thing. Do, do you have a sense? I mean, you must have a sense, but how would you, how would you describe the attitude of the government in the United States to, in, this, in this regard? 
Yeah, and I think this is important as, I mean, we're recording the show near the end of the year to look back at, you know, not only this year, but the year past and, and see that the uranium market and nuclear market is bipartisan. I mean, the Biden administration passed the advance. A big part of that was advancing nuclear power. And now we're seeing, you know, multiple executive orders this year with Trump's administration really trying to push hard to develop not only domestic uranium, but the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, the D Department of Energy and Secretary Chris Wright have been very, very vocal about, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, coming in in the form of grants and loans uh, to the sector to help build it out. So uh, again, it's going to be a very interesting time. One of the things that's sort of uh, in motion right now is a review under Section 232 uh, which is an old trade act from 1962 in which the president can say any critical mineral can now have, you know, different tariffs or quotas, or I think more importantly for uranium, you know, domestic support. And that can be price levels, different procurement levels, the bigger uh, adoption of a strategic reserve for uranium, given that, again, it produces 20 percent of the power in the country. So that's something very near term that could be important for the market. But again, this is a market that's already, you know, woefully undersupplied. Um, so, you know, this support just continues to bolster what is already a very good supply demand uh, fundamental outlook for a commodity. You know, just as an aside, I thought that the appointment of uh, Chris Wright as energy secretary was just a, a brilliant move. Um, Let's go to this. When I I don't trade, uh, you know, uranium like I'll trade crude oil, I trade gold or silver or currencies and all that sort of thing. So for me, uh, a kind of a barometer that I have, I just look at chemical, and chemical I see <laughs> just on my chart right here. Chemical's tripled from the lows here in in April, and I guess it's up. I don't know a factor of five if you go back a few years. This, uh, well, first of all, what do you think of Cameco as a barometer for the uranium space? And is, is, it, a, is it a good example of what's going on? Yeah, it, uh, I mean, it definitely is. I mean, Cameco is, you know, the second largest producer of uranium globally, the biggest uh, Western producer. Uh, they've got two big uh, mines operating in northern Saskatchewan. And they're also vertically integrated. You know, they have uh, in enrichment capacity. They have an investment with Brookfield Asset Management in Westinghouse, so the building of nuclear reactors. So it's, it's a great barometer of the industry as a sector and not just uranium. You know, there's other companies that are, are more uranium focused, but again, for getting an understanding of the sector. And to your point, I mean, <clears throat> a triple of, of the stock price in the last little while is showing how important this is becoming and it's still just getting started it's still just getting government support i mean we haven't even seen a new reactor get you know a shovel on the ground in the united states and they're committing to over 10. Um, so you're seeing things sort of just pick up and i think you know the reaction is to run to the biggest companies first like cameco and we've seen that happen you know in spades and i think they still have lots of room to run with Again, there are different business lines and the uranium that they're bringing online. And I think it's important to also listen to what Grant Isaac, their CFO, is saying when they're talking about how they're selling their uranium. They're not willing to dig it out of the ground and sell it sort of as fast and as quickly as they can at the current $75 to $80 price level. You know, they're looking for price floors around this level with contracts that have ceilings, you know, up to $130 or more. And... They've also got other uh, assets in the ground uranium that they're not willing to bring back online. So, again, you have to look at a commodity and say, you know, here's the current price. Is it high enough to incentivize people to go and dig it out of the ground? And we're not seeing that. There's, you know, some new projects coming online, but we're still not on a, at a price for the commodity that is incentivizing, you know, rapid development or rapid exploration. Uh, it's starting, but it's it's really just getting going. And we think the incentive price is in the triple digits and well into the triple digits. Well, that incentivization that you're talking about, 
it certainly got more people out looking. Now, for instance, you were focused on the on the world famous Athabasca Basin. That is the the richest uranium deposit in the world, I think, generally speaking. Uh, and, but you've shifted your focus. You're now down in Wyoming. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing with Noble Plains. Yeah, Noble Plains is a U.S. focused uranium exploration company. Um, we've got the strategy to go after brownfield projects. So as a junior company, usually the biggest risk is drill bit risk. Are you going to find what you're looking for? And our way of trying to bypass that is going after brownfield projects that have a lot of historical data. And again, when the US was the world's largest producer, they did a lot of exploration work in the 60s, 70s and 80s. So we're going back, finding those historical data sets on projects and doing the work to make those you know, historic findings into new compliant resources. So an example of that is our flagship Duck Creek project. We're currently drilling on that right now. It had over 4,000 historical drill holes, an exploration target of an, uh, an upside of 5.4 million pounds on that project. We've released three sets of drill results. They're all coming in above expectations from those historical results. So a very good start to this program. It'll be running through to the end of, of January-ish. Um, some more results to continue to come. And we should have a compliant resource on that project by the spring of 2026. So again, really taking a strategy of saying we can acquire pounds in the ground or historic pounds in the ground for 50 cents or less and bring them along a roadmap of efficient exploration. And we think a compliant pound in the ground in the United States at 75 to $80 uranium is worth four to five dollars per pound. Uh, I think as the uranium price goes higher, we're going to have leverage to that with the pounds that we can build in the ground. And our second project that we just put news out on Thursday of this past week was getting 1,200 historical drill holes on our Shirley Central project, so our second project. And we got that drill data from UR Energy, one of the few producers in the United States. It's about a 700 million market cap company. And they're building a brand new remote ISR facility right on the board of that project. They became a shareholder of Noble Energy with that data acquisition. So we're going to be able to use that data just like we're using the data at Duck Creek to go out and run an efficient drill program to again, try and move more pounds onto the compliance side of our balance sheet and build out that leverage to a rising uranium market. And I think it's important to note that we did all of this within the last six months. So we've been moving very effectively, very efficiently, because just like I said off the top, you know, the urgency is coming from rising prices and we think the uranium price will start to rise. So our urgency is to get out there, get good projects and move them along quickly before this uranium price really starts to move because we want to be bigger and more leveraged for when that happens. Okay, so uh, your stock symbol is N-O-B-L, like Noble, on the uh, Toronto Venture Exchange, I imagine. Yes, yeah, it's there. And again, you can come mm -hmm. to our, our website. We've got a lot more information on the projects that we're doing. You can sign up for our news. Again, we've had a lot of news flow over the last couple of weeks and we will continue to into the new year. And on, on X, uh, we're Noble Plains Uranium there. Um, again, a lot of updates that are available if, with everything that we're doing. So it's it's an exciting time in the uranium industry. I think it's a very exciting time in the U.S. Uh, uranium market right now with all the uh, administration support that we're seeing. And I think it's just a matter of time before you start to see the spot uranium price really start to move. Um, again, we've seen the long-term contract price continue to move up throughout this year. It's at $86, well above where spot price is now. So with the work that we're doing, uh, with the people that we brought on to our team, so we brought on uh, Chris Healy as director. He was you know, 40 years in the uranium space, 20 of those years with Cameco, much of it down in Casper, Wyoming. We just brought on Luke Norman. He's chairman of uh, U.S. Gold Corp and Silver One Resources. I mean, those companies have a combined market cap of half a billion dollars. And why we brought Luke on that really made him fit with Noble, he's just advanced the CK Gold project in southern Wyoming all the way through permitting, and they're about to go into development. So again, a lot of good connections in the state where we're doing that same kind of work. So good capital markets experience and great uh, permitting experience, good connections in the state. So 
there's a lot happening at Noble and we're working quickly to get bigger, to take advantage of, of this, you know, great uh, fundamental supply demand outlook that we think really has to increase the uh, price of the commodity that we're going after. And, and again, we think that incentive price is, is well into the triple digits. What we're seeing here is uh, surging commodity prices and they're surging on demand and certainly the demand for electricity. It would, I would imagine, looking ahead, is just going to con continue, especially with the AI bill that's going on. There's going to be people doing what Drew's doing, I guess, all over uh, the world, all over North America, but with a particular incentive from the United States government. And I think to some degree in Canada as well, that they were going to encourage people to find these things that we really need rather than say the, the woke attitude we had of a few years ago. Oh, no, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. I think there's been a real change in, in that government attitude, the, the attitude of the population as well, that we, we need to have these things. We need to become, in, to, to some degree, self-sufficient in things so that we're not depending on getting them from other places. Drew, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to visit with us today, filling the big shoes, as you were saying, of, uh, of Rick Rule. And uh, I wish you all the success in looking for uranium in Wyoming. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I look forward to be back at some point in the future. And we'll see you for Christmas dinner. Absolutely. <laughs>